My name is Caroline McIntyre. I'm 57 years old and I'm from Philadelphia. I'm married with two children who are young adults and um, they have um, grown into be human beings that also center their life around um, caring for others. So that's very gratifying and um, I have a dog who I love a lot. I love being in nature. I especially love lakes and mountains. And um, I love my backyard garden. What makes me tick is my profession of being an oncology nurse. And um, what's behind that is the love and compassion that I feel in my heart for other human beings that is in an endless supply in the universe and I never feel depleted um, in working in an oncology setting because there's an endless supply of love and compassion in my heart. Now that uh, disability has taken that from me, I'm searching actively for other arenas in my life in which to channel the love and compassion for other human beings that I feel. My favorite part of life, um, besides my professional work, is um, I've really gotten to learn how to meditate and I feel like there's an entire inner landscape to explore that way. Um, so instead of exploring the outside world, I go inside with these floating eyes and um, I float around and explore that way. And I also use uh, yoga to do that as well, as a, as a lever to get there faster. I discovered the metastasis on my own with a lump on my sternum and uh, sought out, you know, my family physician, um, asked other physicians in the workplace, and um, everyone felt that it was a costochondritis, that it wasn't anything um, to be concerned about. I had had an early stage diagnosis 10 years prior. I was stage 2A and had been heavily treated, chose all the most aggressive treatments. So the fact that it was 10 years later, I guess it, you know, it became so uncomfortable for me that I called a nurse practitioner friend and said, can you just order me a CT of the chest? And she did. And she called me and told me that it was bone metastases on my sternum. Um, and that was two and a half years ago. I was on the phone with her and my first thought was, I'm gonna have an early death. Um, and I knew that to be true because I've cared for many patients that are metastatic and um, depending on the extent of the metastases, I wasn't sure how much time I had, but I knew that I would die. I would die an early death and that it would be from metastatic cancer. I was absolutely certain. I had no idea, I, no thought that, oh, maybe I can you know, maybe it won't happen to me. Maybe, you know, no sorts of magical thinking like that. I was absolutely certain. And then the second feeling that I had was of loss, of complete loss, that um, I would never get the chance to meet a grandchild, that I would never get the chance to grow old with my husband, that I would never get the chance to retire from you know, a job at a, like a retirement age. Um, I would never get the chance to follow through with the plans we were making for a second vacation home and to have a, a space like that for my family to come to. I, you know, so there was a feeling of loss of all those kinds of things in my life. Um, and there was a lot of sadness around that just very, very deep and profound sadness. 
that I had. I turned for support to the other metastatic breast cancer patients because there's a comfort level there. Um, none of them will ever say to me, um, oh, you're going to beat this. Oh, well, when are you done treatment? Or, I, I don't get those kinds of questions from them that I have to field in general in other arenas. I have a sense of comfort level with them that I can talk about anything. We can talk about death and it's not Oh, don't talk about that, it's not pleasant. We, we can talk about death, we can talk about our losses, we can be really clear, and we can have a dark sense of humor, and that's okay. I have dark days, I get beyond them by pulling out my mat and using my body and then meditating. And one of my biggest fears with that is that as my body deteriorates, which it will, which it already has, it's a one-way street there, um, I will no longer be able to use my body in that way to get to that point and I have to find other ways to help me consolidate, um, consolidate that, those feelings so that I will be able to maintain my capacity to enjoy life. What's next up on my agenda in facing an early death is um, to write letters to the grandchildren that I will never meet so that they know that I love them before they were born. Um, maybe there's a way for me to use my voice and my love and my compassion to draw the sword. Um, not that I want to be any type of warrior, just that maybe, maybe my particular message will somehow find a path to have an impact. I've been an oncology nurse at a major comprehensive cancer center for um, 17 years and recently went out on disability and that decision was extremely hard. Um, what was behind it was that you know I have bone metastases, I have stress fractures in both femurs from treatment. I worked in critical care for many years and then I worked peri-anesthesia and on my feet for 12-hour shifts have to take any type of unstable, critical patient and stand at bedside for long hours um, and with tubes and drains and wires. It's a precarious situation. And I found that um, my colleagues were switching assignments to protect me and that I couldn't adequately and safely care for that level of patient. It was a very difficult decision and I went to my oncologist and said, um, I think I need to go out on disability, will you be behind me? And she said, absolutely. So I lost that part of my life because of NBC. And that was, my professional life was stolen by NBC. And that happened about a year to a year and a half ago. It was devastating to lose my career. It was devastating. I get treatment at the same cancer center. So I, when I, I'm there frequently and everyone still knows me because I weren't there for so long. So I make the detour and I go through the operating room and I see the anesthesia staff and I see my colleagues and I might stop by the ICU and see what's going on, you know. So I, I still see my, my colleagues in, in that way, um, but it's, it's a huge loss, you know, it's, it's a huge loss that the patients, you know, gave me so much. I mean, I, I can think of like a, a simple example of someone coming out from the operating room and wasn't able to be extubated yet and so they were still intubated in the recovery room and on monitors and everything and they need to be awake enough to you know for us to extubate them safely and 
having an extubation of a patient and them grabbing my hand when I spoke to them and they said, thank you for talking to me when I couldn't speak back, I heard you. you know, those kind of moments, you, you just can't, you just really can't describe what, that, what that's like and to have those moments on a daily basis and to lose that was very devastating to me because there's no shortage of customers at the cancer center, <laughs> but there definitely is a shortage of good nurses. And um, so, so that, that was very hard. The most difficult thing living with NBC is the daily challenges that it's very rare to have a day that's better than before. It's usually always worse and worse and worse. So, you know, you, you may have a new symptom and your first thought is, is this treatment related or is this a cancer progression? You just don't know. And your doctor can't tell you either. Usually they can't. They can help you pick through and sort and they can give their opinion but even as a medical professional, living in this body, I sometimes have trouble distinguishing the sensations that I feel and what they are. And um, it's particularly hard on the daily to not jump to a conclusion that, oh, this new pain in my hip, is it arthritis or is it cancer? It's, that's just a hard thing to deal with every day. As an oncology nurse at a major comprehensive cancer center, I had access to employee screening mammograms yearly. And I had a level of awareness that I think is above the general population. My early stage was caught on an employee screening mammogram, and the mammogram the year before was clean. And I was stage 2A, and, and I was 45 years old. I was followed closely by scans. I had complete access to a cancer center, and yet it still happened. Yes, it's not statistically, statistically significant because I'm one person, but I am an example of an individual who can't be more aware, can't have more access to care, and I will still die an early death from metastatic breast cancer. Um, what brings me the most joy is helping other people. So I'm hoping that this, this project can be helpful to other people. Um, and I feel that um, as an oncology nurse with MBC that I can have a, may have a unique way of helping my local women. It's important to share the story of MBC because I believe in the general public, it's really not understood accurately. I would say to others that you have to chop wood and carry water, and you have to do it on the daily, and you have to look for every opportunity that when somebody does ask you about your disease, that you kind of compose yourself, engage where this person is, and try to describe it in an accurate way that you can perhaps change a misconception that they have. Any opportunity that you have to do that um, will be helpful. And to do that, you need clarity yourself. You need the, the, you need the clarity and you need the capacity to understand where this person may have a knowledge deficit and how you can best address that so that it can be heard. When getting a, a metastatic diagnosis, you know, it's overwhelming in a lot of ways. And the first best source of information is, of course, your medical professional oncologist because they have 10 more years of school than everybody else in cellular biology and those types of things. Um, and 
it's really important to have a good relationship with them that you feel that they have things in their back pocket they may not tell you about. You don't have to know everything they're thinking about. Um, it doesn't have to be this information deluge from your oncologist. It's really helpful, I think, if you have somebody that you trust, that you have recommend personal recommendations on. But yeah, people will come at you from every which way. Oh, I've read this thing about quark cheese and green tea and all, all sorts of things. Um, and um, my response to those people has always been, oh, thank you. I you know that's really kind of you to be thinking of me and I know you want the best for me, but I'm really gonna go with the things that have um, clinical trials behind it. And I will go to, you know, the more well-known um, websites that have actual data behind them. Um, and I will look things up and if I need help, if I need help picking through it, you know, um, I'll find someone who's knowledgeable in cancer to help me make a decision. I guess my message to the world around NBC would be to change the languaging, the combat languaging, and that we could get to a place where we reach that point um, that that um, that we could have a good death for everyone with NBC. That would that would be my ultimate goal. Working in oncology for a lot of years and with metastatic cancer, we we approach it with this combative type of a, a combative type of a whole mentality and approach and um, we're all going to leave these human bodies. Where we find that point is very much up for debate I think and I, I don't think we do a really good job with that and I, I think that you know we have this whole idea that you know, somehow accepting death will harm the image of the institution, harm the image of the cancer center, you know, and, you know, uh, shocking, people die from cancer. I mean, that's, you know, that would, I would love to see some steps in that direction. Yes, we need more money for research, we need better treatments, and we need to know why cancer develops in the first place, and we need to know who, and we need to know how, and we need to know how to stop it. Um, and we've made some strides in that. But we need, we need more for that, and we need more around the idea that, that death instead of an enemy can become our ally. If we live with the daily idea that we are gonna die, it takes the charge out of that. And you can use death, you can use it as your ally. I actually will um, meditate on death and I practice it in my, in my meditations so that when it comes, I'm ready. So that it's more of like a remembrance. When it happens, it will be more of a remembrance. I imagine it so much that it will be a memory to me when I die. Fearless means to me is that I can look at my cancer, though it is somewhat an enemy because it is that which wants to do me harm, I can address my cancer that is 99.9% .9 my DNA and I can approach it to say, May we live together in this body in peace for the benefit of us both. That's what being fearless means to me.